good evening, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming, and happy Hanukkah uh, for those of you celebrating. Uh, my name is Rebecca Zeffert, and I'm the founder and executive director of the Israel Asia Center. The Israel Asia Center is a nonprofit organization dedicated to building a shared future between Israel and different countries in the Asia region. With a, recogni a rec recognition that relations between countries are all about people-to-people -people connections, since 2011, we've been running programs fo focused on building future leaders in Israel-Asia relations. Alumni of our programs are now actively engaged in strengthening Israel's relations with about 10 different countries in Asia, across almost every sector, including business, innovation and technology, government, diplomacy, nonprofit, and media. In addition, since uh, our founding in 2009, we've been running thought leadership events and working with key decision-making key decision-making groups between Israel and Asia to explore the challenges, the opportunities that exist between our countries, and how these relationships will be shaped in the next, next five, 10, even 20 years from now and beyond. Over the past couple of years, there's been a tipping point, I think, in the Israel-China relationship. Um, Israel may have entered the China game rel or relatively or the China game relatively late in the day. However, we're now seeing more Israeli companies setting up operations in China. Chinese investments in Israel are growing at staggering rates, and Israel is about to conclude its negotiations of the FTA with China, which will boost its bilateral trade even further. However, with all the talk on increased interest from China in Israel regarding investments and tapping into Israel's innovation ecosystem, we found that there was barely any mention of one of the most important policy decisions in the world today. In particular, what's been missing on the discussions here in Israel are, um, on China is really like the one belt, one road policy and awareness or dialogue around the bigger picture issues impacting Israel-China Israel relations and even Israel itself. In the case of the One Belt, One Road policy, it's not just about what Israel has to offer in terms of innovation. More to the point, it's about where we are on the map. A juxtaposition between Europe, Africa, and Asia. And really, what does the one belt, one, bo one belt, one road policy mean for Israel? How do we as Israel fit into the bigger picture of China's larger trade strategy? And how will that be shaping China's future role in the region? So today we're going to be examining the one belt, one road in more detail and the business as well as the geopolitical impact it will have on Israel and the region. With us here today are Wu Chen, uh, Wu Chen is joining us from Shanghai, and he's the editorial director of a new Chinese language publication by The Economist, a global business review. And prior to that, he was head of editorial for Asia Pacific at Eurofinance and editor of C CFO China, both part of The Economist group. Roy Feder is the managing director of APCO Worldwide in Israel. APCO is a global public affairs and business diplomacy firm headed in, or headquartered in Washington, DC. And over the past few years, Roy has overseen some of the most high profile China-focused government programs, including the Shavit China program, which was set up to support Israeli industries to enter the China market. And since 2011, he advises the Israeli government on its China, India, and Japan fund, which was set up to help Israeli companies from all industries to establish a presence in Israel's key target markets. Lionel Friedfeld is CEO and Managing Director of Israel Asian Fund. And prior to that, he worked as an investment banker in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Israel. He's the co-author of the recently published book, China and Israel. And he's also financial analyst on I24 News. And as, as a slight change to our schedule, uh, moderating today's panel is Aurora Carlson. Aurora has the Asia desk at our crowd, the Isra Israeli equity, equity crowdfunding platform. And uh, she previously managed uh, Asia investor relations at Giza Venture Capital. Prior to that, she hosted 
a weekly documentary style program for China Central Television, exploring socioeconomic challenges throughout the country and um, um, a Mandarin uh, um, a Mandarin language program on the uh, Olympic Games in China. So uh, thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to a really interesting panel here today, and also for your questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you to you three for being here today. Um, we all, all three of us and, and all of us in the room all know about Chinese investment around the world and its growth um, in trade and foreign direct investments and exports. You name it, it's, it's growing. But what we don't know about is actually the topic we're here to talk about today, uh, One Belt, One Road. So if we can just start off with what is this policy? Uh, why does it exist? and perhaps just the main reasons for it coming about now in this uh, point in time. Um, I would love to hear on this uh, broad aspect from all three of you, but maybe Wu Chen, if you can start. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, my name is Wu Chen. I'm from the Economist Global Business Review, and I'm based in Shanghai. So One Belt, One Road is actually a major public policy uh, initiative from China, and uh, the belt and the road. The, the road is the old Silk Road, and the belt is actually the maritime uh, 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 trading route that China links China to the rest of the world. And uh, actually, it affects on the Belt and Road countries, there are about 60 plus countries that China is interested in, I wouldn't say projecting China's power, but actually building a stronger, stronger trading link and also provide more investment in these countries. And there are some, there are short term, medium term, and long term goals from One Belt, One Road. But I want to emphasize that this is a long-term initiative. So the fact that you haven't heard about it is that I think it's being a very initial phase. But it serves, I would say, three major purposes. One, of course, as China growing stronger, Chinese economy now is the second largest economy in the world, China needs to have security in terms of access to energy. So how do you secure and have alternative routes to energy and commodities. One Belt, One Road is an important part. Second part is, if you look at the belt, uh, the road, Silk Road, Silk Road starts from Western China to Middle, uh, 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 Central Asia to uh, Middle East and uh, uh, Europe and Africa. So it's also a major push for China. You know, you, you know China's Chinese economy is slowing down. But China wants to actually move economic activity and manufacturing activity more inland. So the starting point, from the, especially for the road, Silk Road, is actually Western China. And the third thing, I think that's a grand ambition or grand, grand scheme from China is to, you know, it could be two possible outcomes. One is China come up with an alternative global trade and financial infrastructure. Or China is building something that will be complementary and finally incorporated into the global financial and trade infrastructure. So the whole push for uh, a road and, uh, into these countries is you know, going to be financed or partially financed by AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure, uh, infrastructure uh, Bank, and uh, the Silk Road Fund. And that's and that AIB can be seen as an alternative to IMF and World Bank, but it also could be an impetus for uh, reform. And one final point, maybe uh, my, my colleagues could add on it, is of course China has faced uh, tremendous pressure uh, in internally of its own economic, uh, economic growth. And one of the major challenges China faces is excess capacity in the manufacturing sector, especially in the construction, steel, cement sector. And China wants to the One Belt, One Road initiative to actually uh, export these excess capacity. And uh, you know, it's, it's something crucial for China. China could come up with a fairly competitive uh, package for any recipient countries to build infrastructure projects. And that would be the starting point for One Belt, One Road. But I think uh, the potential for One Belt, One Road is more than that. But it's also, there's a lot of challenges. I'll stop there. and. Uh, Maybe my colleagues could add on that. <clears throat> I mean, just to maybe add a, f a few points, um, and I think anybody here who, who knows uh, China, who studied China, 
uh, would, would realize that um, when, when China has any kind of policy initially, it's, um, it's a domestic-driven policy and a domestic-driven um, need, um, in this case, uh, to figure out future, future growth engines uh, for China's economy, for state-owned enterprises, um, for uh, uh, providing opportunity for Western provinces, uh, which are um, behind in terms of their growth capability with uh, Eastern, well, the Eastern wealthy provinces. Um, and then lastly, uh, the, the issue of how do you connect globally, how do you connect with all the other um, countries in, in, uh, in Asia. Um, there are those who would also argue that um, some of this policy is driven by competition with TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that the U.S. is leading. Uh, but again, I don't think that's something that should be seen as the first uh, reason why China would be investing uh, so much um, in this endeavor, uh, rather as a, as a secondary um, a, a need that they have to, uh, to expand globally. Hi. I would like to raise mainly two points regarding to the One World, One Belt strategy. The first point is an historical point because uh, actually it is the One Belt, One World strategy. It's called the New Silk Road. For the New Silk Road, actually, the initiative was created in 2013 and then President Xi Jinping. And the idea was to come back to the golden age of trading in between the East, China, and the West. The Silk Road was created under the Han Dynasty. And it was really the golden age of trading when you had traders coming from, you know, even Israel going to China. And I'll just take you two examples. The first example, uh, if we look at Marco Polo, the famous explorator, uh, in his book, uh, uh, Marvels of the World, he's mentioning already that in Beijing, the majority of traders are Jewish traders. So he is already connecting China to Israel. The second example I want to mention is at that time, China was really an innovation nation. They invented the gunpowder, they invented the art of making paper, and actually, so again, a Jewish group called the Radha Knights from the south of France have brought back paper to the Western world, which means that this strategy, one world, one belt strategy, is really linking Israel or the Jewish people to China. The second point I want to make, it's a macroeconomics uh, 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 fact, that China for the past 20 years fuel is growth based on one key driver and the competitive advantage of China was a very low labor cost. We all experienced Chinese product made in China coming from Europe, from the US, very cheap product. By the way, the same that in the 60s and 70s when you wanted to buy a car, you didn't want to buy a Japanese car because you thought they were also very cheap. So Chinese competitive advantage for the past 20 years was mainly driven by low labor cost. Today, China realized that in order to gain a new competitive advantage to compete against the US, but also Japan, South Korea, they have to go into innovation. And this is one of the main reasons that China is coming to Israel is to pick up the innovation and maybe we'll have an opportunity to speak about the tech environment, but I'm sure you are very familiar with that. Meaning that the One Belt, One World strategy is actually set up by China as I would say corporate China to secure a global supply management chain that they will be, they have the capabilities of manufacturing in China, they have the financial capabilities to finance, and in five, ten years you will have a lot of liquidities and most of the IPOs will not look down to the Nasdaq but actually will down to China, and they will use the Silk Road, the new Silk Road, to ship their goods because tomorrow Chinese are going to go in Haifa, they're going to be in Ashdod, they, by the way, they're investing into Israel, but not only. If we're looking at Greece, they al already bought part of the Greece of Athens, the peers, but they're also buying ports or airports, uh, like the Toulouse in Tosa France airport. So basically, I think this is another step into uh, Chinese development. Maybe I can add one thing on this. Is this is not a one-way street. This is actually two-way street. So definitely China is gonna invest provide a lot of financing and also export uh, manufacturing to the Belt and Road countries. But also, I think it's creating a gateway so that these countries could actually do, do facilitate more trade with China and also more investment in China, or in Israel's case, really try to get access to this continental-sized economy. I mean, this is the, the lar could be the largest in a few years, and also still relatively growing fast continental-sized economy and the demand for goods 
and the demand for change, uh, better, better goods, better services, more in innovative solutions to the problems China face. I think this is something that through Belt and Road, you know, if you, if you really pay more attention to all these policy initiatives, innovative companies could really benefit. You could really scale up fairly quickly. Thank you. Um, that actually leads me into my next question that was meant for you, but I'll bring it to you. Um, you, top, you, you talked about what the benefits are for these 60-plus uh, countries, one of which is Israel, just to be clear. Um, it being a gateway for trade, for exports, bigger markets, internationalization. So, Roy, what do you see beyond this being a, a tr gateway for trade? Are there any political implications uh, or perhaps even further economic uh, benefits to this? to the, the 60 countries? Uh, before, before talking about the, the, the 60 somewhat countries, and I think, which I probably know, it's a little bit better in terms of the, you know, the different countries on the road which, would, in which we, would be part of it, many of whom are what are defined as high political risk countries for China. Um, and uh, whether it's because of financial capability, um, violence, extreme, uh, extreme Islam uh, rising and so on. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about, about Israel. Um, and I think that, um, you know, people are hearing about the one belt, one road policy. Um, yes, for the last five years, the conversation about Israel-China relations has uh, gone around uh, sort of the, the innovation uh, roadway, the, uh, uh, the investment of Israeli companies or the, the attempts of Israeli companies to enter the Chinese market and the investments of the Alibabas, Huawei, ZTEs um, into Israel. Um, one belt, one road is, is, is a different concept. It's, it's, it's about um, Israel's geopolitical significance uh, for for China uh, for a few reasons. Uh, first and foremost, and uh, Lionel mentioned, uh, mentioned this, um, is um, it, what would be the, what's called the Red Med, uh, but the possibility uh, to circumvent the Suez Canal. Many of you have no, uh, know that Israel has recently um, approved a, a train link between um, Ashdod and Elat, um, and there are talks between the governments about um, China potentially building this train link. Uh, this will be a dramatic uh, shift to Israel's economy, not only because it allows cargo to go from one port to the other, or potentially through Jordan, through Aqaba, uh, into Israel, um, but it p positions Israel um, as, as a, first of all, a logistics hub. You have to um, have warehouses to you know, take all these goods. You need to have uh, logistics supplies, uh, ecosystems of, uh, of insurance, of operation and maintenance. Um, from an economic uh, perspective, it could be a main, major driver for Israel as, as a country, as well as to many other countries um, on, 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 the Silk, uh, on the Silk Road, on the uh, One Belt, One Road. Um, uh, the, the, the second thing um, is, is uh, the proximity to uh, energy, and I don't know if you're going to talk about that later, but I'll, I'll mention it now. Um, and conversations I'm having with some policymakers in, in, in Asian countries, uh, the one interesting thing is something that's less discussed in Israel today is that um, the discovery of gas, whether it's in Egypt, whether it's here, it's not just about are you going to, is Israel going to be exporting gas to other markets, to Asia and so on, but is Israel all of a sudden going to become a place where manufacturing capacity could exist? So if a, a major Chinese automotive company wants to be close to its European markets, uh, it would be wise to be in a place that has quick access to energy and then quick access to the markets. I think those are the key things which are relevant for Israel's economy. That's a, and that's a, a sort of a step on, on top and beyond the innovation relationship that I believe will grow in any, in any event. Um, but maybe Wunshe would like to say something about the, uh, the other markets on, on the way. You know, I'm not an expert on geopolitics, but you know, you need to look at uh, uh, several things. You know, China has, a, as, I, as I emphasized earlier, uh, security for energy supplies, security for commodities is crucial. So the link that Israel could provide, alternative to Suez Canal, is important. But China, one of the major things that China is actually doing, uh, working on, is its investment in Pakistan, the China-Pakistan corridor, 400 billion US dollars in terms of investment. That's a major push to link the port in Pakistan to Western China. Uh, mainly for security reasons, but also you could, you, you know, the, the, the major concern U.S. would have on this link is it could also use for military. If China is building, China now, chi Chinese companies are having uh, leased the port in uh, Pakistan, 
but that could be used for military base. But whether China would go take that one extra step, it's still uh, unknown. But if you look at other areas, because China, there are other alternative routes China is placing. One is Myanmar. You know, China has actually was actually doing a huge investment in Myanmar, building dams, and also one of the important thing is uh, a strategic port in Myanmar. That port was delayed because of the uh, recent changes in Myanmar, and then Myanmar is more open to uh, Western investment. China is only one of the investors. Before three years ago, China is the investor. The other case would be Sri Lanka. Again, a strategic port in Sri Lanka, which is, was also put on hold because of the changes in government. So again, political risks and regional risks are high for Chinese investment in this area, but China's uh, selection for strategic ports and routes to secure its energy supply and potentially project its power is there. But uh, as we discussed earlier, China in the history, I mean in the recent history, in the past uh, several uh, uh, centuries, China is not a expansionist country. So I think I would say China, the, most of the initiative would be uh, really uh, uh, for peace, not for, for, for expansion, but for securing and facilitating trade. I think the other part of the, the equation and talking about China's growth is really China wanted to, uh, uh, you know, in a way single-handedly wanted to export its growth model. One of the growth model of what makes China, uh, you know, the, the, the Chinese, what makes, what, what's the underpinning uh, major kind of columns for China's growth is you need to build solid, good infrastructure, right? You know, if, if you don't have good infrastructure, your mines, your, your goods couldn't be exported easily. So if you only look at Asia alone, by 2020, the need, I think calculated by IMF, the need for infrastructure building is a trillion requires eight trillion dollars. So that's huge. And if you added Africa, added Middle East, that could double or triple the amount. So who is gonna providing the financing? One Belt, One Road could be an interesting initiative, but China alone couldn't support all these financing. But if you could come up with uh, an initiative that's led by or co-led by AIIB, but also financed by private uh, banks, because according to one bank, uh, calculation by 2020, I, AIIB and other policy banks, if they are keen to help build infrastructure, the need, they, what they can capable doing is to provide one trillion dollar funding for infrastructure building. Not much out of for eight trillion dollar needs, but still substantial. But if that could be leveled up, if the private sector could come up with even bigger amount of money, that would give a huge change. Look, imagine, I mean, one of the things that is already on the map uh, in Asia along the one by one road is to link Kunming, Western, Southwest China, all the way to Singapore via a railway link. That's not being, you know, so that's huge. Right? And then China is also actively engaged in, and China and Japan is competing for high speed uh, railway in Thailand. So imagine, you know, because if you look at what China is capable of, in five years, China built, I think, 10,000 kilometers of high-speed train. I mean, that's phenomenal. That's, in less than five years, China becomes the largest country with high-speed train networks. If China could export that miracle, even you know, like 10% of that in Asia or in other parts of the world, it would be a very different thing. So that's something interesting. Thank you. I, I want to quote you on that. Export the miracle. <laughs> um, I'll turn to you, Lionel. Um, given all of this and his comments about Pakistan, within Israel, have we seen um, some successful examples of uh, developments, maybe investments or infrastructure bids uh, in, if on One Belt, One Road yeah. policy? I'll give you one figure which is uh, easy to understand. By 2020, the capital outflow of China for investment will be more than 5 trillion US dollars. Meaning that if Israel managed to catch 1%, and 1% is nothing, it's already 50 billion dollars coming to Israel. We have seen that already, uh, and you mentioned to, to me a few deals, and I think 
there is the one road, one belt strategy, and there is a global uh, Chinese-Israeli relationship, investment relationship, and investment and foreign investment doesn't come to a country uh, out of the blue and by chance. Uh, and why only for the past five years, uh, Chinese has a very strong appetite for making investment in Israel. For sure, we all know the innovation, the high tech scene, but only this factor is not enough to uh, explain the appetite of Asian and Chinese investors. You also have to put into perspective that from approximately 2005, when uh, Stanley Fisher was appointed at the, the Bank of Israel, uh, he brought a lot of credibility and he was very well known among international investors. And if you look into this, this period 2005 till today, uh, Israel joined the OECD, which is basically the United Nation of, you know, of the growing economy, of the economics economy. Uh, afterwards, uh, Israel joined what is uh, maybe not very known, a company called CLS, which is actually a clearing company, clearing the shekel. So the shekel used to be not an international currency. Today is an international currency. Why is this important? It's important because when you have large players like Bright Food buying uh, a stake in Tnuva for $1.2 billion, okay? When you have Came China buying a stake to Amate Shimagam for $2.4 billion, you have to have liquidity into the shekel. So the fact that Israel you know, came in 2008, entered into this clearing house is also a key important fact. But there is many facts. The MSCI index changed from emerging countries to developed countries. Israel, the credit rating from S&P, Moody's, they all increased. So if we're speaking about thinking about investment from an infrastructure uh, point of view, it's understand, I think, to, important to understand the whole picture about the China and Israeli uh, environment. This is, I think, the first point. And the second point, and I think we didn't uh, so far mention it, Israel is an Asian country. Ask yourself, where is located Israel and which continent? It's Asia. Maybe, you know, it could be surprising, but it's a fact. And it's also related to that Chinese, and actually uh, we will mention it, but uh, we're in a book uh, that we recently published called Israel and China from Silk Road to the Innovation Highway that beyond business, beyond politics. It's a question of culture, a question that the Chinese admire Israel from a very long time. Uh, and when we're speaking about investment, you've got key people that open up investment from China to Israel, and one of the key people is Li Kashin. Li Kashin already invested in Israel in 99. Yes, it's telecom, but when he exited the telecom business, into, he went into the water business and set up the Anchinsa a water business, and they have today the largest destination project in the world with ID in Sorek. And this is, I think, key driver of the relationship and key people that manage to open the relationship. Then today you have a lot of Chinese company, construction company doing the light train in Tel Aviv, doing the tunnel in Haifa, operating or building the port in Ashdod. And I think this is the, the cultural aspect has also to be mentioned. Thank you. Um, Roy, Roy, given what, what uh, Lionel just said, is it, do you believe it's actually possible to be able to determine which deals and which developments are a direct result of One Belt Run Road? And not just Chinese global investment trends? That's, that's a very good question. I, the, the quick answer is um, I don't know if you could actually pin that to the One Belt, One Road policy. Um, you know, the Carmel Tunnels were maybe the beginning of, uh, you know, Chinese having a comfort level with, with, uh, by, of seeing Israel as part of its infrastructure um, expansion. Um, I would add to what Lionel said before, and maybe this touches uh, to your point. Um, I think about, there was the, the, what I call the, the $10 billion mark, or uh, the $10 billion trade um, arrangement, uh, where um, I, you know, over the, over the last few decades, um, China has not invested in Israel. Um, and one of the reasons it hasn't invested in Israel is because it was concerned about uh, responses from the region. Um, and if you looked at the buy trade relations that China has had with key markets around Israel, it was at around $10 billion, uh, give or take. So with Iran, it was a bit more, with um, Egypt, Egypt, it was less, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and in, in 2013, Israel passed that $10 billion uh, mark as well. Um, and so that um, so made Israel a, a key trading partner to China, which allowed it to go and invest um, without any concern um, of its surrounding um, area. 
um, because we realized it, it was just as, um, as, uh, as, as, as important a trade partner in the Middle East as the rest of, of, of these markets. Um, if you add the Arab Spring to that, um, and China's need to think strategically about going through Pakistan, going through some of the um, Arab, Arab world, um, going through um, uh, more, more problematic um, uh, regions, um, then its policy with regards to Israel can be part of the One Belt, One Road policy, not only from a geopolitical perspective, but also from a security perspective. It wants to tap into the know-how and the capability Israel has in terms of security, and you're seeing today companies, Israeli companies, out in China, uh, helping Chinese airport authorities um, in Western China and in, in, uh, in other provinces um, to, uh, to protect themselves, to build airports. I'm sure it's going to you know, go into maritime as well, because China will need to figure out how to do that, and it does look to Israel for some of that uh, knowledge and capability. Thank you. Wu <laughs> Chen. China has a lot of policies, uh, both domestic and international, which are uh, broad-reaching, uh, long-term, very almost dreamlike. Uh, we can see that as China went into Africa, as people talk about a new world order, new financial order. What is different about this policy than other policies in the past, say, 10 years? Um, and right now it's in its infancy, one belt, one road. How do you see the stages of maturity uh, going forward? And I think we also did not mention how long this policy is for. So if you could explain a few of those points. Yeah, I, think, I think this one by one road policy is really a policy initiated by Xi Jinping, the uh, president. And uh, it, it's his dream of, and it's, it's a ground vision of China, what China should do as a rising power and what will be the results of China becoming a rising power. So it's a starting point, there's an end goal. The end goal is actually, the time horizon for one bound one road is actually till 2049. And the 20, they chose 2049 because that's the 100 year of the founding of the People's Republic. And that's the vision. So it's really a long-term vision. There'll be short-term ups and downs, but I think long-term, that China wanted to do, become a powerful country, one of the major powers in, China, in the world. And I think the second thing is, you, know, you, you talk about stages. I think the key point for One Belt, One Road to really be effective is that it shouldn't be just China's dream or ch the projection of China's, be it uh, you know, uh, uh, access cap capacity or you know, newly found financing power. It should really be China become one of the key players in the global trade and financial institution either China providing an alternative that forced IMF and World Bank to change, or China become part of the new rule setter. Because I think China has benefited since 2001 when China joined WTO as a free rider for the global economic infrastructure and policy. But I think China now has come to a stage where it's important for China to be at the key league table, to voice its concerns, to provide its suggestions, to set the rules, not China itself setting the rules, but China working with key players to set the rules. And then I think one by one road is an, a, a signal saying that China wanted to start that journey. But I think another part of saying you need to look at one by one road is that it needs to be, most of the projects needs to be commercially viable. If you talk to state -owned, even state-owned enterprises, are you interested in one by one road? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not to say, yes, we, we want to be there, you know. Whenever the party wants us to be, we will be there. You know, it's not that. It's really about, you know, what's the, how do you arrange the financing? How do you, you know, all, most of the countries are risky. When, you know, some countries are okay, but most of the country, you, for example, Pakistan, I think there's a lot of concern about this 400 billion US dollar investment because you are going through Taliban controlled area and then Western China in Xinjiang is actually, there's a lot of things with uh, radical exam and uh, you know, can you actually manage that corridor not being, uh, become a target for 
terrorism. So I think that's a, that's a big concern. But there are also concerns about, you know, many of the countries are, doesn't have a high credit rating. They don't have the capacity, even from the government level, to provide the financing. Would China willing to take up all the risks in terms of financing? Or Ch can China come up with a multilateral approach to do that? And finally, and the most important test is that would most of these projects attract private investment? Would companies really willing to participate in these projects? I think China, the limit of China to, you know, there's a limit on, on how, how much China could spend on building roads and uh, uh, building uh, other infrastructure pro projects. You need to actually buy, get the buy-in. And I think the attitudes towards One Belt, One Road along these 60 countries is also different. Most of the countries are still adopting a wait and see attitude. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I haven't seen any, any major country kind of um, actively you know, take, join the bandwagon saying that, yes, we want China's investment, let's do that. And so it's, I think there's, a, there's still a kind of a lukewarm attitude and China also needs to gear up its own PR for One Belt, One Road. So what's your true intentions? What's the benefit that the recipient countries would get? What's the benefit for uh, regionally and globally? I think these are the questions that China still need to answer. But as far as I see it, again, going back, it's a, it's a vision, it's a ground vision. I think China needs that kind of vision. And it's a, it's a vision to reinforce China as a rising power, but it's also a vision that China's growth could benefit uh, a lot of countries and could also contribute to building and shaping a new uh, global trade and finance uh, policy and infrastructure. If I could just uh, highlight one thing um, in terms of countries that are making the most effort to go out to China and identify projects for investment, um, you could name um, certainly our, our friends in this neighborhood, uh, which Israel certainly needs to pay close attention to. Um, you know, President Sisi of Egypt was in China twice over the last year. Uh, there's a strategic partnership that's been signed between Egypt and China in December 2014. Um, and now the Chinese um, government um, is talking about um, investing in, in, in power plants, uh, I mean, a light rail system uh, between Cairo and the city of Ramadan, um, and, and a few other things that the Egyptians are certainly uh, looking to gain from, uh, from China, seeing themselves as part of the um, uh, One Belt, One Road uh, initiative. Uh, King Abdullah of Jordan has just um, agreed on a strate strategic partnership and has set up a task force uh, with, uh, with the Chinese government. Um, he was there in September uh, to sign those agreements. Um, uh, Turkey is certainly um, sort of being squeezed in all kinds of different directions um, and would like to, uh, to partner with China on various projects uh, that could come through it uh, with, the, with the one belt element of, of, of the initiative. The challenge that Turkey faces is that China is not too happy about the support uh, that Turkey seems to be giving to um, the Uyghurs based in Xinjiang province. Um, and that is certainly a point of concern for China, which is, um, uh, could, could disrupt the, that relationship. Um, and last, um, uh, to, to mention at least uh, on this panel, is uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, which is certainly um, strengthening its relationship with China, not only as an oil exporter to China, um, and Saudi is certainly the, um, uh, the, the, the leading exporter of energy to China today, uh, but also enhancing its own energy projects that China is investing into, uh, having discussions about 16 nuclear power plants to be built in, uh, in Saudi and uh, between now and 2022, um, and also uh, to discuss um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, getting some arms um, uh, imports uh, from China uh, to Saudi, uh, a point of concern to, um, to the US. Thank you. Um, moving from Saudi to the US, how should Israel navigate its intimate relationship with the US given uh, its location on One Belt, One Road, given its location in the eyes of uh, Chinese interests. It, how should it go forward at this point in time? Carefully. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, there, there's, there's no meeting that we have uh, with the Israeli government when a question of uh, an Israeli company wanting to get support uh, to go into, into China, um, is it a, a, a dual usage product or service? high sensitivity in Israel towards uh, the U.S. Um, uh, with regards to Israel, gro Israel's growing relationship to, uh, with China. We saw uh, that when Israel um, um, you know, offered to be a founding member of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, 
um, and you know the the the, the only um, U.S. ally that has not joined that yet is Japan. Um, people thought that Israel would be that uh, country, and Israel is offered to join. Um, uh, but you know, definitely there are there are a lot of things that the U.S. is concerned about. Um, and if I go back to the point I made uh, before, it sounds like a, a Chinese exhibition behind us. Um, if I go back to the point I made before regarding the uh, motivators, I think more than anything else, Israel needs to be uh, helpful um, in, in explaining Chinese policy to its U.S. counterparts. Um, and again, the, the, the key motivator, if you look at almost any policy initiative that China has had, um, it's, one, it's got one big concern. It needs to feed 1.3 billion people. Um, it needs to make sure that those people do not uh, rise against um, uh, the party because of pollution, because of um, a real estate bubble, because of any other issue that's domestic and is in the top of the minds of, uh, of Xi Jinping and, uh, and the rest of the leadership. Um, if Israel can, pay, can play um, a role in uh, helping to use the, your term, uh, uh, tell a better PR story about China's interests, um, I think in many ways it could be a very interesting triangle approach uh, that links Israel, China, and the U.S., um, as, um, uh, as, as complementary nations uh, rather than as um, Israel being a sticking point in U.S.-China relations. Just one, at one point is that I think, as you said, it's important uh, if Israel could be a link, critical link between the two powers because I think in the history book, uh, a rising power and established power, it's not that easy to get along. I mean. They could get into wars, they could get into direct competitions, they could get into all kinds of nasty consequences. Could this time be different? I think China needs to learn, China needs to adapt, China needs to do more PR, but I think it's also important for the United States to accept that China is a rising power, not try to come up with uh, things to contain China. And I think what Japan, it has put Japan in a very awkward position. I think that the fact that Japan uh, sided with the United States on uh, TPP and not in AIB is that it's very, very hard for Japan to accept that China has exceeded Japan as the second largest economy. It's not that easy, but I think Japan, it, but, uh, again, Japan is an economic power, it's not a military power, so I think they have to accept that, but United States is different. But I think for China, uh, I think a lot of concerns is about uh, China's true intentions. Is China going to be a military power. I think that's a very large question and an important question people need to answer both outside China and inside China because if China is going to, because China, the evidence has shown that China has invested a lot in military build up and China has uh, flexed its muscles just uh, uh, a few months back in this major parade. So uh, what kind of messages is China sending out to the world? Uh, is China going to challenge uh, the, the world political order? and? So I think that's a big thing. Uh, we, don't, we don't know the answers yet, but I think that's a major uh, uh, kind of a, uh, uh, I wouldn't say risk factor that everybody needs to pay attention to. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add one more thing. I think um, you know, it's, it's, it's important. The, um, um, going back to what I was talking about with the Arab countries around us and how they are uh, you know, looking to have ways to invest in China to grow the relationships with, with China. Um, undoubtedly, um, the US foreign policy um, has led uh, to a void in this part of the world. Um, and you see the, uh, the moderate countries um, in the Middle East certainly being tra attracted to you know, the, 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 the new major superpower um, and trying to see how strategically uh, they can um, you know, build relationship, build investments, uh, build projects, uh, and build um, you know, uh, political allies um, in China. China has an opportunity to, um, to help tell its story to the US um, I don't know if it will do it, but it, it can if it pays a more active role in finding uh, ways to incentivize political stability in here. Uh, by way of example, um, if the Red Med connection does take place between um, uh, Eilat and Ashdod to connect Aqaba to that, and for China to incentivize the Jordanians to collaborate with Israel on such a project, uh, could be viewed in a positive way by U.S. policymakers. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, uh, just strengthening the relationship between moderates in this part of the world is something the U.S. is trying to do, has been unsuccessful. Um, you know, China could, if it chooses to, play a more um, uh, critical role with that. Maybe I just want to add one point on the U.S.-China equation. Uh, the first point is China intention is not to be a superpower. Th China intention is to be the superpower. And, the, you know, the time, I think, is not a problem for China 
whether it's five, 10 years or 15 years, they will get there. The second point I want to mention is a corporate level. Actually, in the battle between the US and China and the battle, one of the largest battlefield is Israel. Because if you look today, like companies like Apple, like Facebook, you know, they're buying here uh, Israeli startups, they put R&D center, but now the Chinese saw what's happening here are exactly doing the same. So uh, when uh, Alibaba is coming here and buying companies like Visual Lead, Alibaba is uh, competing against eBay, against Amazon, okay? Xiaomi made investment in Israel. Xiaomi is competing uh, against Apple. It's basically the same product as one third of the, of, of, of the price. So one of the next, in few years, we'll see an increased competition into the market of VCs, startup, private equity investment, because basically China uh, is willing to further go inside the Israeli market because they have understood that the US and actually was the first company was IBM Intel actually was kind of a American market the Israeli market was kind of an American market but it's not an American anymore and I think the competition will intensify I think in the future but that's that's a very healthy competition and because I think uh, the, the, yeah the fact that it's a billion uh, dollar competition yeah, it's a, it's a healthy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Roy, I know that you work closely with uh, in consulting for the China desk, China India and uh, Japan. Japan desk of the government. Um, any word yet on what Israeli officials are saying that you can share with us about One Belt, One Road? I mean, I think if you look at um, you know, the, the policy with regards to China these days, it's mostly being led from the prime minister's office. Um, the, the, the task force to collaborate with NDRC on a, on a few projects, whether it's the, um, uh, the, 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 the water projects or the um, hospital projects or any kind of sort of strategic um, innovation collaboration projects with the government of China are led by NDRC on the China side and the Israel and the Prime Minister's office and the National Economic uh, Council, um, Council here. Um, I would imagine that if you go into most government offices and if you talk to most uh, members of Knesset and you say one belt, one road, no one will know what you're talking about. Um, and I would imagine that if you Google um, uh, one belt, one road in, in Hebrew, um, there's hardly be anything there. Um, and so I think in many ways, there's an education to be done um, about the significance of this project, the sensitivities that exist, the opportunities, the challenges, uh, because it's certainly gonna be something that um, you know, policymakers uh, um, should open their eyes to. I would imagine that if you go to most Israeli um, government officials and you ask them who the prime minister of, Ch of China is, they wouldn't necessarily know. Um, they would know who the pr president of France is, the UK, and so on. China, probably less so. And that, that, that's a challenge. This last question is for all of you. Uh, what are the downsides for Israel getting involved uh, in this? Anyone? Okay. I'll start. I think the first downside is, uh, I mean, in Israel, and Israelis uh, shouldn't be too naive about China's intention because China has a lot of investment. They're either willing to invest into an infrastructure, and we understand it's to secure their own supply chain, what I call the supply chain, ports, roads, uh, airports. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the, 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 there was much controversy when actually uh, Bright Food but uh, Tnuva, because Tnuva is basically the largest dairy company in Israel. So is it a strategy company? A company that provides milk and dairy product to Israel? I think it's a, it's, it's a question to raise. And I think the one of the, mo uh, I think the most important downsides is that in Israel, uh, maybe there will be a point that they understand that it's not because Chinese money is, is, is coming to Israel, they're willing to buy every single like, good company that Israelis have to sell. And I think this is, uh, you know, they have the ability to say no. And I think this is one of the key, I think, downsides of the, of, the, of the relationship. And also, I think corporate in Israel have to understand that, as you mentioned at the beginning, the new Silk Road, it's a road, okay? So it, it comes to from point A to point B, but it's not a one-way road. So Israeli corporates have to go to China also and to, and to the East. And it's also an exchange of information. So, thank you. I, I couldn't say what's the downside for Israel. It's my first trip to Israel, but I would emphasize on, on what you've said. Is that the Chinese investment in Israel is really need to determine which are market-oriented and which are has other intentions. But I think if you look at the 
past several years, most of the deals are really market oriented. Uh, take, uh, you know, a, a, a Bright Dairy, uh, for, for example, the Bright Group, they have, they are, they, they are sale enterprises, but I think they have a very specific and clear goal is that they want to go abroad and look at really good, solid agriculture related enterprises. The Tanuva deal. Yeah, and then buy them. So not, not only in Israel, but also in Spain, they are in uh, France. They are, they are buying into even supermarkets because it's about learning, it's about sourcing, it's about at the end of the day bringing all this back to China and help ride on the boom of consumption, upgrade in consumption. Chinese, at the end of the day, Chinese, more, more middle class in China would want better uh, food and high quality food, and that's where it is. And then uh, in the process, they are also learning how to run a good uh, enterprises because you know I, when I talk to the leadership in China, uh, China, uh, the the Everbright Group group, the the first thing they say is that we are still we're not at a stage where we could run these companies that we acquire. We will rely on the local team because I think they they have a solid team to run this. But in the process, we are learning. I think that's a that's a stage where it is. So even for an SOE, I would say most of the deals would be still market driven, rather than uh, having other intentions. I, I think in, in, in most cases, this is a, a wonderful opportunity. I mean, undoubtedly, um, you know, the, the, the capabilities, the technologies, um, the, the financial, um, um, the, the, finan the finance uh, availability is something Israel should look to and, and take full leverage of. The one risk, um, going back to the uh, mission we talked before, is the perception in the U.S. Um, and, and I think that um, and you know, I've had a few conversations about this this morning. There are uh, people in the U.S., uh, including uh, you know, Jews with uh, close ties to Israel, uh, which have always been, uh, which, which, which see China as a current or future enemy of the U.S. and are concerned about Israel's growing relationship with China and how that impacts their investments here. Um, and so that is something that should be taken care of. There's certainly a, a, a perception uh, that needs to change regarding China um, uh, here and in, in other Western markets. Um, you know, markets around the world are you know, coming up with all kinds of anti-dumping schemes against solar, against um, you know other commodities. Um, again, if, if if you view China's core interest, there are some interests which are a bit more aggressive. But the core interest um, is to provide jobs, provide food, provide um, uh, sustainability for life uh, for its own uh, um, uh, population. Uh, then most other things, um, you know, you just have to adapt yourself to. And if you have a very low cost of solar um, in China, and U.S. companies are going to complain that Chinese are, are dumping, they need to understand, no, you know, Chinese companies are just producing a lower cost with lower, lower labor, um, and you and, and, and to understand that to install a solar panel requires people to go out and install them and, and operate them and finance them and insure them. And so that's creating jobs globally. Um, there's no in, any, any covert intent uh, to take over a certain industry. There are relative advantages that China has and the world has to um, take advantage of those and not be too, too so afraid of, of everything that uh, could be a positive thing. Have no fear, that's the lesson. Um, I'd like to now open up uh, the floor to questions. Um, Uh, you mentioned regarding the one belt, one road policy, and China's economy, which has had an uh, exponential growth. Obviously, that cannot go on forever. The graph will come down. So my question is, is China's economic policy and its strategic uh, objective uh, contradictory to each other? You mentioned the multi-billion dollar uh, project in the corridor of Pakistan. Uh, research shows that, that South China Sea is right now the most dangerous place on Earth. Uh, with naval ships with nuclear warheads actually going neck to neck. So uh, the environment which China is creating around it, uh, is, is, is it contradictory to its economic policy? In uh, October, US has, uh, uh, United States just launched a Freedom of Navigation Initiative. They send one more vessel to supp support the Japanese, and Australia is gonna come in too. So is it, is, it, is it a testament of your economic growth, or is it actually contradicting it? I think, I think you need to put it into, again, I, I don't think I have the answer, but you need to put it into a context where 
the support for the presidency is really about the average Chinese people. And uh, I think he wants to show China is a rising power, a rising power in many aspects, including the projection, projection of power uh, uh, in China, East China, uh, South China Sea. But you know, again, let's just look at what's going on in East China Sea. You know, a year ago, people were speculating that you know, what's the probability of China and Japan fighting a war or a little conflict uh, over Diaoyu or uh, the, the island. But today, it's all cooled down. China and Japan has actually come up with a scheme where they could actually, they, they would discuss and warn each other for, to prevent any potential conflict. What China could do in uh, South China Sea would be the same. If they have the assurance or if they feel that US is not going to contain China in TPP and other things, because I think it's all what kind of cards China is playing. China is playing, I think, gradually China is getting more skillful in terms of playing these cards. So I see the South China Sea as a card that China is playing, not that China has true intentions of really occupying the whole space. I mean, they, they could make certain concessions if China is being accepted as part of an important power to shape future global trade and, uh, and financial schemes. So that's the key thing. And if, if you look at the, the other part of China's economic policy, A, of course, China's uh, economic growth would slow down. So China actually needs to find out other ways for growth. And investment overseas is one, one of the pillars. If you look at the Japan story, you know, Japan relied ever more heavily on Japan's investment overseas. And Japan has done a tremendous job in doing that. China, this year is the first year that China's overseas ODI, you know, investment overseas, over, over, exceed, exceeds the amount of the FDI China is attracting. So one by one road and other policies would serve that because you want to make better investment. You want Chinese uh, people to go to the right place to do in the investment. And in the, in the future, China would benefit from these investments. So I, I, I think, you know, at, at the end of the day, I don't see China as an aggressor. I mean, there's a still a possibility that uh, we are wrong, but I would see China wanted to be recognized as a rising economic power, and China actually is willing to uh, take more responsibility. But you know, it's not. Th this is the kind of collaboration that most major economic powers need to work together, rather than the other way around. Yeah, and, and to add to that, um, if, if you look historically, um, you know, rising economic superpowers uh, want to have a strong navy, and the reason for that is to protect trade. Uh, you know, the uh, Britain and England was certainly uh, the fr a prime example of that. Uh, the U.S. Um, and now China. And I don't think there's a, certainly a conflict of interest. There's maybe shared responsibility for free trade and uh, in, in, in key trade routes in different oceans. Um, and so if, if that's the approach superpowers will take, um, I, I don't see this going into necessarily a, uh, um, a combative situation, uh, but rather more of a cooperative situation, certainly with, with the risks that some of these waterways uh, entail. Thank you. Uh, another question? Yes. Okay, this question is for Mr. Chen. Given the advancement and the tremendous progress that China has been making so far, would you say that eventually, or maybe in a few years, they will surpass the U.S. as a superpower? I don't, you know, there are all kinds of calculations uh, by, you know, if the, the most rosy uh, prediction, I mean, of course, the definition of superpower is, you know, if we only talk about economically, the most rosy uh, expectation is by 2035. If China keeps on growing at 6.5% on average, China would exceed the United States as the largest uh, economy in the world. But uh, again, you know, China is still, you know, China has so many people. Per, per capita income is still very, very low. I mean, China, and, and also China is, uh, I would say China is a continent in a sense it's uneven, right? You know, Western China is still pretty poor. And so I agree with my colleague here is that China has a lot of internal problems that they need to address. Feeding, uh, satisfying, creating enough jobs for Chinese people, and then meeting the continued 
higher demand of the Chinese people for better life, for high quality life, for better air, all these will keep China occupied. So China wouldn't be a superpower in a sense that China wants to project its power outside and create its own sphere of influence. But the fact that China wants to have a secure future, meaning that China needs to have secure supplies for f food, commodities, energy, and China also relies heavily on trade, and China wants to be a global facilitator of trade, and that has to be recognized. So that's what a, a, a great power is. And of course, I think there are some symbolic areas where China wanted to be recognized as a power, or as, as what Xi Jinping would say, uh, China wants to regain what China used to be uh, two or 300 years ago as a world leader. So that's something I think, don't take it fully as China's uh, expansionist agenda, but as something China, uh, Chinese people are proud. So they wanted to be recognized and respected in that sense, but not necessarily really trying to interfere with other people's affairs. But I think at the end of the day, it's also important for China to uh, show the responsibilities. You've, you've said clearly that you know, if China would be, become more active in addressing some of the problem areas like the Middle East, and uh, it become another force to encourage collaboration rather than fighting, I think that's actually a good thing. That could, that, that's, that's something China could play easily a role. Uh, but you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so are, uh, uh, one is, do they want to and be, are they capable of doing so and see what would be the perception if China is actively pursuing all this? Because is it being pursued as China is contributing to the uh, maintaining and uh, uh, reinforcing global order or is China is, is, is uh, tr have, having its own agenda? I think at the end of the day, uh, to what extent China could make its intentions clear and people trust that's China's intentions. That's still a murky saying. I don't, we don't know yet. You know, even people in China, we don't know exactly. But you know, uh, uh, if you look at all the other things, I would say you know, there's a high probability that China doesn't have uh, 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 intentions other than make sure that Chinese economy will grow as smoothly as possible, continue on the growth trajectory and to create more jobs and to to feed more Chinese people and that's a that's a basic thing. I mean, also if I could add um, I mean you also see the relationship between Xi Jinping and, and President Obama it's, it's a good relationship I mean they're uh, striking deals and they're looking at interests that they both share in terms of cutting down emissions and, and so on and so forth. Um, will China be a superpower yes or no? Most likely yes, most likely fast. Um, does that um, put any kind of uh, burden on, on the US? You know, probably to uh, collaborate on fixing up its infrastructure. Um, you know, it's not, it's not going to be detrimental for its national security the way many Americans, I think, uh, uh, perceive. Please. Uh, perhaps you care to comment on two things. The one is Djibouti. How do you see it from China? Uh, from Israel, I can give you all sorts of answers. And the other is the arbitration, which has just started, the question of the jurisdiction and so on. Uh, about the islands and uh, how it's going to play out. Or maybe it's just a game of shadow boxing. How do you see it? Is yeah. Djibouti part of... I'm, I'm not sure I could ask, answer about Djibouti. It's not my area of expertise. I'm sorry. And the next question is about the Fisherman Islands. I think, I think the Diaoyu thing is, I mean, again, I see it as playing cards because China and Japan has reached an agreement in the 70s to you know, just put, put it on hold, whether Diaoyu is China's or Japan's, but seek out actively ways to develop the area around it. But of course, Japan is an easy target for China to rally nationalist sentiments. If anything you want to, I mean, if you look at the, the you know the TV dra drama, I mean, in China one of the easiest thing you produce is produce a, a, a TV drama uh, against Japanese soldiers. Right? You know how many Japanese soldiers are killed in Chinese TVs? Millions, right? So so that's that's a propaganda play, but it's an easy play. But I think it's also could be manipulated easily because 
you know, uh, it's just bilateral rather than uh, getting other par parties around. And the fact that now things cool down, it, I think it's a good thing because whether China and Japan could work together, uh, uh, share more, uh, uh, come up with more shared objectives, that's an unknown because it's not only China's intention, but Abe is equally to be blamed for for what Japan is doing on, on the island. Yeah. Yeah, so the South China Sea is a very different thing. But again, I, I said, if China want to make concessions, China could. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, um, three questions. We'll take them all together. So you first. I was wondering what would be the best advice for upcoming generations growing into a higher level of Israel-China relations. What is your best advice you could give them? Okay, so, uh, second question next to you. Hi, my name is Ronen. Uh, I just want to know, um, in recent years since Modi was elected, the relations between Israel and India have warmed up. How would Israel's participation in the One Belt, One Road policy affect its relations with India? Same question I wanted to ask. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I maybe answer the, the first question. I, I would say just to get exposure to Asia and to and to China. I think I think it's very important to spend time either in Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, uh, and actually either at the university level to do internship or also to work. And I think meeting people is very important. Afterwards, it depends. You know, what, uh, where do you want to live? And I think it's a question of choice. Uh, what we uh, seeing actually the most effective way, because uh, if you're uh, based in Israel and you're Israeli, it's better to be based in Israel and working with people you trust uh, directly from China. Because if you're going to live for a long time in China, at the end of the day, it's like a Chinese uh, individual living in Israel. It will never have the network that you have in China. So I think, and there is a lot of you know, incubators, Chinese in Israel or Israeli in China. I think we have, and I think it's important to keep the, the rule very simple. In China, you have to be Chinese. In Israel, you have to be Israelis. It doesn't mean that uh, you shouldn't speak Chinese or you shouldn't get exposure or you shouldn't have a lot of good friends in China. But I think to be very effective business-wise, I think you have to have a clear separation. And the question on Modi? Yeah, I'm going to give that a go, and, and anybody who studied Asian studies at Hebrew University is a good friend, so I'm happy to get, talk to you afterwards. Um, in terms of uh, India, I mean, I, I'd, I'd say the following. Um, I think in many respects, the OBOR is a, is, is a prime interest of India, um, certainly as, as the route goes through Pakistan. Um, and if you think about um, what that, you know, the, 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 the openness and the, I mean, whether the biggest fear that both China and India share is fundamental Islam taking over Pakistan. And if there are any kind of uh, projects, initiatives, policies uh, that enable uh, better uh, controlled supports, investment, uh, that allow the moderates in Pakistan to stay in power um, and, and curb down on, on, on extremism, it's a very positive thing for both. And if you'll see the relationship between Modi and Xi Jinping, I'm out of time. If you see the relationship between uh, Modi and uh, Xi Jinping, uh, those are also growing strong. Um, because they have shared interests in, the, in that part of the world. From Israel's perspective, um, you know, you go at b both of them at the same time, um, and that's what it's doing, and so far it's proving itself to be a pretty good strategy. Yeah, I, I don't think you need to choose between China and India. And I think uh, ultimately China and India need to figure out a better way to facilitate investment in both countries and then bilateral uh, uh, trade in both countries. I mean, Huawei has done a good job in terms of investing in, in India, and I heard uh, Tata is actually making inroads, not only building uh, cars in China, but also providing uh, uh, share services and other things in China. So I think there's a great potential because, you know, in terms of China and India, the competition in the business world is, there's not a lot of overlap. There's a, actually a lot of areas where it's actually complementary to one another. Going back to the advice of uh, students, I think, you know, it'd be interesting if you could spend a few years in China and then actually go back and finding your roots because then you'll actually be the major uh, kind of someone who is doing the bridge. Because I think, you know, when I come to 
uh, this is my first year. I talked to quite a lot of fellows, and it's kind of one of the interesting comments that you know, that being a Chinese on the street in Tel Aviv, you will still be a lot of times will be stopped by by Israelis and asking where are you coming from, you know, what what are you doing, but you know you wouldn't experience that in the United States because there are just so many. Chinese in, in, the, in the states. That's a, that, that's a good and bad thing. You know, we want more people traveling and uh, and uh, meeting new friends here, and vice versa. You know, uh, Israeli in China, I think, will be welcomed, and uh, a lot of people would be curious why you are coming here. What 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 you could bring? You know, tell me more about Israel. I mean, innovation and startup, uh, being a startup nation. I think that's something that's fascinating Chinese, and you need to actually, you know. Because you know the, the stakes are high, and then everyone is trying to be uh, competing with you. So, can you come up with something different in the next five years, still on the cutting edge of innovation? That's that's a true test. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we'll close it. Thank you. It's we've learned so much about this quite lesser known but very large and very long term policy. And I'm sure this is not the first time we, the last time we will be hearing of it. It's more to come. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank, thank our panelists, uh, Roy, um, Wu Chen, Lionel, and Aurora for joining us here on the panel today. Um, I think there's been some important points to ponder. And I really hope, as Aurora said, this will be just the beginning of a more in-depth discussion on One Belt, One Road here in Israel. Um, for those of you who are interested, we're going to be posting a video of today's event on our, the Israel Asia Center website and YouTube channel. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Thank you.